uh, cloud. And you know, one of the aspects that I'm going to talk about is you know, some of the specific cloud storage products that we have today at HPE, but also on a broader sense of how, again, when we look at it across the portfolio and how we're delivering this to our customers is how do you build a storage portfolio that is built for the cloud from ground up? And this is really rooted from you know, really what we're taking to market today, which is you know, the world's most intelligent storage that's built for our customers' hybrid cloud environments and world you know, circa 2018. So, you know, many of you guys have probably, you know, talked to customers and worked with customers that have gone through or am going through a transformation, and a lot of it is rooted around their cloud strategy. You know, I think, you know, whether these questions we have up here are somewhat rhetorical now, right, whether you have a cloud-first strategy, uh, you know, what applications do I try to move there, do I re-architect, do I try to lift and shift some of my data or some of my applications, you know, how do I still maintain this in my current data center infrastructure to keep my lights on? Uh, and how do I do this with the different cloud providers and cloud vendors out there with avoiding lock-in? And we recognize right, these are common uh, problems and common questions that our customers are asking. And from an HPE standpoint, right, we're really here to help. And there's two aspects we do. So you know, I think I'll highlight a little bit of, about what our services organization does, you know, HP Point Next, uh, and of course, really drill down in what you know, the storage team does. And ultimately, right, we think it's about your data, right, and having intelligent storage wrapped around that, and having the right technology and having the right expertise to help you execute on your cloud strategy is very important. So, you know, ultimately, Point Next, that's our services organization. They provide a floor of your consulting and advisory services. Uh, they specifically actually, uh, around the same time last year after they acquired Nimble Storage, we also acquired uh, a consulting practice called you know, um, Cloud Technology Partners, and that's been wrapped into our, our services organization as well too. And they absolutely help our customers with their cloud transformation and their cloud strategy. So those are areas they, they you know, specifically focus on, uh, help them you know, determine what applications are suited for a cloud, you know, ultimately helping them to move, innovate, and you know, ultimately run uh, their hybrid cloud environments. And then from the you know, HPE storage standpoint, obviously we're focusing on our data, right? Helping you determine and, and move that data uh, as properly as possible. Helping you work on the specific applications and the different type of data sets and move those as well too. And of course, you know, one of the key points you, we highlight there is you know, your existing data center infrastructure. How do we make that work as seamlessly as possible today, right? Again, you need to keep your lights on, you need to innovate, you need to be able to move that data to and from the cloud as seamlessly as possible. And, and really, our, our view of it is, right, delivering a platform that's built for cloud and enabling that data mobility without limits. So, you know, one of the things I'll highlight here, you know, again, you know, there's already some talk today around you know, leveraging the cloud and the type of storage that's available in the cloud today. So really, I'll kind of like to separate the world into you know, kind of two types of applications that are moving to the cloud. You know, you get segmented in, in different ways, but you know, I like to just keep things simple. Uh, the first is really kind of looking at, you know, the cloud native applications. And these are, you know, applications that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, they're, they're really built from the ground, again, ground up. Uh, to use the cloud using cloud native APIs, you know it could be you know things like uh, you know, your traditional uh, office applications like Office 365. They, you know, Microsoft rebuilt that to run on the cloud. Uh, productivity like Dropbox uh, or even consumer applications like Instagram, or Facebook. They've all been built from the ground up to use the cloud, and they leverage you know from a storage standpoint primarily uh, you know object storage such as S3 or Azure Blobs or, or Glacier. Um, you know, the other area that we see, you know, from an enterprise standpoint that leverages, you know, object storage is, is backup. So we'll talk a little bit about how backup and data protection, uh, you know, aligns to, to the cloud as well, too. Now, the area that, you know, we're primarily focused on, you know, here at HPE is really around the enterprise, right, and the enterprise applications. So we do know that, you know, these applications are, you know, when you look at it, you know, they've been around for quite some time. They're built on you know, relational databases such as your Oracle uh, or your SQL Server or built on your traditional business application platforms like SAP. 
And you know, a lot of these now, right, we're looking at the latest survey data I saw, you know, just that came in recently. Um, you know, again, people beyond now, you know, backup and DR, which we'll talk about, people are now really starting to look at how do I move these traditional primary applications to the cloud, right? And one of the aspects we see is, right, one of the challenges is, right, there's a lot of enterprise-grade capabilities we deliver in the data center and in our storage devices today that are different, right? It's a different context in the cloud, and, and really, you know, these applications are seeking the same level of enterprise capabilities that right now in the cloud, it's, it's, it's relatively different and, and lacking. So, you know, from an HPE standpoint, what do we mean, right, when we say our storage is built for, for the cloud? And again, you know, we're talking about, you know, our on-premises devices as well as our cloud storage offerings that we have in place. Ultimately, we want to enable our customers to run any type of workload anywhere, right? You want to have not just data mobility, but the workload mobility, and these should apply, right, to your enterprise applications like your Oracle and SAP, as well as your data protection, as well as you know, some of the you know, mode two applications that Omer talked about this morning. Now, to enable this data mobility, right, again, we want to be able to support all the common platforms, and obviously AWS Azure and GC GCP are some of the you know, most popular ones out there today. Again, you know, we're very much aware that you know, they continue to grow, and our customers, you know, even if they are operating their hyperscale cloud environments as siloed applications, right, they are doing it today. On top of that, right, we understand that there's an ecosystem of partners and providers that deliver a, a variety of tool sets uh, along the lines of, you know, again, containers and automation associated with that. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and, and Michael's going to walk you through more details of what we're doing there today, as well as, again, you know, everything from uh, IT automation to uh, configuration automation. So all these different tool sets that we leverage, right, this now needs to be fully integrated both on your storage devices, tightly integrated to the cloud. So when you're looking at it from a DevOps or a cloud ops um, workflow, right, we want to make those workflows as seamless as possible. So whether it's a storage volume on a, a nimble storage all flash array or whether it's a cloud volume, you know, running on AWS or Azure, that, that experience, right, from a developer standpoint and from an administrator's, administrator's standpoint should be as seamless and as transparent as possible. So, you know, just, you know, some of the, you know, simple things that we're delivering to customers today. So this is not just a vision, this is reality, right? So I'll just hit upon a couple of quick things and then, again, get, get into some of the more details about it. You know, we have, you know, with some of our cloud solutions, so HPE Cloud Volumes, which is our block uh, cloud storage service, right? That's delivering enterprise class capabilities that's millions of times more durable and reliable than you know, existing cloud storage. We got HPE Cloud Bank Storage, which is you know, focused around backup, DR, and archiving that is helping customers you know, leverage your know, low-cost cloud storage like S3 and Azure Blobs, but further reduce that by a factor of 20, leveraging some of our core you know, deduplication capabilities that's built into our, our enterprise arrays and our enterprise storage devices. And then you know, working with our advisory services at Point Next, uh, and cloud technology partners, right? We're really helping customers really you know, zone in on their cloud spend because that's still, I think, one of the biggest uh, challenges we hear from customers is you know, how do I manage my resources? How do I manage shadow IT? How do I manage cloud costs, right? And, and again, this is something one area that we work with, again, with our advisory services, as well as some of the capabilities we're doing within our cloud products and also within InfoSight as well, too. So, so you know, that's probably something, if I have time, I'll show you guys. So for this presentation, I'll focus in on, on kind of two key products, right? As I mentioned, uh, HPE Cloud Volumes as well as HPE Cloud Bank Storage. So I'll start uh, with the backup and DR first, and then I'll get into what we do with Cloud Volumes for the primary and secondary storage space. So, you know, when we talk about any workload anywhere, right? Let's let's talk about okay, yeah. You know, let's look at the full gamut, right? From primary all the way down to backup and DR. Now, we all know that you know, backup is already a very popular use case, right, in the cloud. The question is, right, you know, we, you know, we all back up, right, our, our phones, we all back up our photos and all that. The question is, you know, and I know we got some, you know, backup and data protection partners here too, is 
how do you do that as seamlessly, seamlessly as possible for your enterprise workloads, right, without really impacting you know, existing tool sets, existing uh, workflows that, that the customers may have? Because again, it's not the same thing as backing up your laptop or backing up your phone to the cloud. So, you know, first off is, you know, let's be clear, right, you know, best practices of data protection is the one, one, two, three, or three, two, one rule, right, have at least three copies uh, you know, on different sets of media and at least one of them off-site, right, and kind of given the economics and the availability and the simplicity, right, the cloud makes a lot, a lot of sense, right, for that off-site copy. So, you know, how do we do this today with HPE? Well, we have, as I mentioned, HPE Cloud Bank Storage. And you know, HPE Cloud Bank Storage, I, you know, I think really makes enterprise cloud backup, DR, and archiving very, very simple. Uh, and again, without impacting existing workflows. So you know, first off, right, it is really a, a feature and capability that we've built into our Store One's backup appliances. Right? So, so this is you know, something that you know, existing customers today can get this as, as a software update right? to, to really have the ability now to leverage cloud storage as a destination to st store or archive your backup data. So you know, what does this get you? Right? Again, this gets you the ability to use S3, Azure Blobs, and again, you age that to some of the even lower cost tiers like Glacier uh, or, or again, infrequent access or right? all the different uh, you know, abbreviations they have there to really bring down your long-term costs. Um, and, and really what this does mean, right, it allows you to scale more, right? Again, you don't need to keep as much of your data off, you know, on site, right? You can archive. Maybe you have long term retention policies uh, due to governance or compliance rules. So you need to keep lots of copies uh, or ret retain it for many, many years. This allows you to do that without necessarily growing your data center footprint, right? And again, we make it very simple because it's, again, directly integrated to our appliances. Now, you know, one of the areas that really I think you know, changes the game is. Right, you know, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but what I believe, you know, what we deliver in terms of our value with, with cloud bank storage is again to make it very simple to integrate to existing enterprise workflows and tools uh, and, and software sets. Right, so we're still we're integrating at multiple levels. Right, so at the cloud level, so let's you know start from the right and go go to the left. Right, at the cloud level, right, we we have the S3, we have the Azure Blobs. Right, so it's leveraging those direct APIs. Uh, we actually, you know, in terms of our integration, we work actually directly with AWS, and they've actually you know, looked at our implementation and certified it. Uh, one of the reasons is you, know, you can leverage cloud storage today, but if you're not doing it in the right manner, so you know, they basically told us one of our major, major competitors that also has a very popular backup appliance, right? They're also writing, you know, give, give you the capability to tier data into S3. But the way they were writing it, because of the block sizes, you know, again, if any of you guys have some familiarity with uh, object storage, you know, they were really creating very small objects and sending that to the cloud. And, and because of that, that actually created um, you know more data transfer, uh, you know, over the cloud and uh, and more storage capacity in the cloud as well too. So it was actually very co cost ineffective. Uh, for that implementation. So again, by working very closely with guys like Azure and AWS, it enables us to, to deliver the best implementation on the cloud storage side. Now, when you look at, again, from an enterprise data protection workflow, right, you know, all the traditional backup uh, software, like the Commvaults and, and the Veeams and, and the data protectors and Veritas, right, we still need to work within those frameworks. So you, we have the right plugins and the right agents, right, to work directly with, with those software providers. And then, of course, we want to make this all work seamlessly with our primary storage, with 3PAR. And then, you know, you know not to steal the thunder uh, of, of our teammates here, uh, you know, very soon we're also going to have integration with, with Nimble Storage. So that allows us to really complete that workflow, right, and, and plug in to, to the existing tool sets, right, whether it be the cloud, whether it be the, the, your backup software, whether it be the, your primary storage arrays, and allow you to do that back, cloud backup very simply. So I, I think this is very unique because it really allows customers to leverage the cloud, right, for backup without necessarily impacting. Uh, it's really, again, a software feature you turn on on our Star One appliance. Yes? So it's the backup that's pushed up to the cloud? Mm -hmm. With cloud, with the, the cloud bank. Okay. 
And I'm just looking, I'm thinking from an administrative perspective as a former admin. So let's say I have Commvault and I create a, um, a backup policy. And instead of uh, having the, the local on-prem storage to, to hold that, mm -hmm. that backup, it's just going to go straight up to Azure or It's, it's, it's basically a policy, policy right? So you can set, set a, a retention policy based on, you know, I could keep, you know, my maybe my first five local snapshots or, or backups locally, and then I could age my older uh, backups, right, to, to the cloud. So it's all policy driven, which is really cool, right? So you're leveraging your same tools, right, to, to, to that, um, it's just, you know, it, it's in our location, right? So, you know, we're leveraging existing tools from, what, as you say, either our existing backup partners, or even uh, we have some of the tools directly built into our, our primary storage arrays in 3PAR and Nimble that allow you to set those policies, so. Based off the applications you have up there for like SQL and Exchange and SAP and Oracle, how many are actually using cloud as a, a target? That's, That's a good, good question. question. I don't have that data uh, at this point. I, I think, uh, you know, as, as we you know, add you know, InfoSight capabilities across the portfolio, we'll see more of that. Like today, we, we, we know on Nimble, is Nimble's fully integrated with InfoSight, right? All the different workloads, and then what's being replicated to different devices. So I think that's something that we will be able to see into the future as well, too. Um, Azure already has the, you know, the SQL platform. Yes. Where if you're you now using on-premises and you're sending your backups to the cloud, why not just use uh, you know, SQL in Azure already, mm -hmm. where you can kind of eliminate that the operational um, I guess overhead of maintaining backups and and whatnot. Yeah, yeah I think I mean that's that's a different question around you know how much of the especially like talking with SQL and database or whether we're talking about you know SQL Server or we're talking about Oracle and and RDS uh, you know on on um, on AWS is how much do you want to just move the data, or how much do you want to do some refactoring around the application? Because there is st still, I know Microsoft, you know, from yeah. SQL to S SQL is pretty seamless, but there's still some refactoring that's that's required. Uh, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, there is still a desire for, for a lot of customers to, and this is something you know, we'll see also in the containers demo, is, is to really take that whole application, right, and then also take the persistent data and, and move it. Uh, without any type of refactoring, right? So there is still a desire to do some of that for different use cases. Obviously, a lot of applications make sense to refactor to leverage, as you say, this, the you know the built-in SQL service in, in Azure and whatnot. And that's not really the area where you know we're really addressing here, right? That's that's an area where again the different types of applications with different SLAs or different development requirements may require you know, a more, well, you know, in this case, yeah, closer to a lift and shift versus a refactoring. Cool. All right. So, you know, what are the benefits, right, that we're delivering here? So first off, as I said, I think the simplicity of kind of plug into your existing enterprise uh, workflows, where it'd be, you know, your all flash, or your data protection and backup software workflows is, is huge. From the economic side, the other thing that's very important is, is really understand that we're leveraging you know, our best in class dedupe compression data reduction, right, before we send the data to the cloud. And that, that, that is huge because even as you're using something like S3 or Blobs or Glacier, you know, if you could get that additional 10 to 20x reduction, right, that's gonna obviously reduce your cloud storage cost to, to effectively a fraction of a penny, right, per gigabyte, which is huge. And more importantly, right, it's gonna reduce your data transfer costs, right? As we know, right, that's probably the bigger expense with, with the cloud today is, is just moving the data around. Uh, so, so ultimately, we think you know, this is a, a good solution that's, again, really geared towards the enterprise data protection and backup without necessarily disrupting uh, you know, the existing workflows and really plug and play, turn it on, and now you have cloud backup as part of your you know, existing data protection workflow. So that's backup and DR. So now let's talk a little bit about primary storage and, and secondary uh, use cases as well too. So really, how do we leverage flash right uh, in the cloud today? So again, you know, a little bit of compare and contrast, right? Uh, you know, there is your know, block storage today in the cloud, 
right? It's not the S3s and the glaciers or the blobs. It's, it's you know, I think uh, Amazon has what they call EBS, elastic block storage. Uh, Azure has Azure disks and SSDs, which are effectively, you know, mirrored disks and SSDs, right, it, it, in the cloud, which, again, you could compare and contrast what you get out of the disk and SSD versus what you get out of a SAN and an enterprise storage array. And, and that's effectively the difference you're gonna see, right? Is that you know, the current block storage solution is, is really an enhanced disk or SSD. You're gonna have a higher failure rate out of that. In, in the case of uh, AWS, it's you know, as high as 0.2% uh, or one in 500. Uh, and you know, a lot of it is, is very limited because again, you're, you're, you're framed to the context of a disk or SSD Right, you're you're framed to you know, the size, uh, you're you're framed to you know, whether that could be shared across multiple hosts, uh, and again, you're limited in terms of the capabilities around snapshots and data protection as well too. The other aspect, of course, is especially for block storage. Right, it, it's really geared towards again. Here's a device, a you know, storage device attached to a VM. Right, there really is no data mobility built in. Uh, and you know, if, whether you want to you know, move it from one cloud provider or another, or again, if you want to take that data, right? We talked about earlier this morning around really having that Uber uh, data mobility, taking EBS data and moving that back on premise, right? That's again, something that's not possible today. And again, we alluded to the data transfer costs and the data egress costs, which are again, very high uh, you know, today in the cloud. And the last part, again, we alluded to a little bit is around the lack of visibility. Again, there's a lot of tools now that are coming out to help you monitor your usage in the cloud, help you track your uh, your spend. Uh, but still, right, this is something that when we talk to customers, they really still don't know what's going on, right? You don't know what you don't see, right? So this is an area, again, we believe we could help with both you know, our cloud storage offerings as well as some of the intelligence we build into InfoSight. So, you know, the second solution I want to talk about is HP Cloud Volumes, and it is, as I alluded to, an enterprise-grade multi-cloud storage service for running enterprise applications on both AWS and Azure. Now, you know, it is, you know, this is a fully cl uh, public cloud service, so customers, I'll show in the demo, right, you log in through a portal uh, and you start using it, uh, just like a cloud service, and, you know, it's, you pay as you go, or again, you know, customers can you connect to it with uh, AWS and Azure compute resources. So because this is you know, HP's own managed cloud, right, we do have to ensure it's, again, in the same data centers or in close proximity to both uh, AWS and Azure data centers, so you get that low latency, uh, you know, high, high performance access. So some of you guys may have, we launched Cloud Volumes last year, and some of you guys may have seen, you know, uh, you know last year around this time, we were just getting out a preview, uh, you know, tech preview with Cloud Volumes. Uh, since then, obviously, we've added a lot of capabilities in the past year. Uh, you know, so again, the data mobility being one of the key ones. Last year, I think when, when we were talking about this, we were just uh, setting up uh, one-way replication, uh, you know, from on-prem to cloud. Now we have basically the full gamut, and that's something I'll uh, demo to you uh, today, which is, you know, again, you know, replicating data from on-prem to cloud, from, from cloud back to on-prem, uh, being able to fail over in, in both directions, right, which is very key for, for our customers. Uh, and then, you know, from a DevOps standpoint, this is, again, was a key area, I think, uh, you know, some, some people have mentioned in the past is, you know, how do we get the right uh, DevOps automation? Well, you gotta provide the right APIs. So now we have a full set of REST APIs with cloud volumes, as well as a command line interface for, for people that like to do scripting. Uh, and again, you know, Michael's gonna show you actually what's new again with our containers plugin, which is you know, some really cool stuff that we can leverage as well too in terms of you know, moving containerized data and moving uh, persistence data that are in, in containers. Uh, and the last point, again, I, I keep harping on it on the visibility. I'll actually show you in the demo uh, the ability to, to estimate costs in real time, right, when you're deploying storage volumes, as well as leveraging InfoSight to provide predictive cost estimates. So before you even choose to move a single byte of data to the cloud, you can get a good estimate of how much it's gonna actually cost you. So again, you know, there were some questions about, you know, how do we leverage InfoSight today? So we've actually have some of that, right, today. Is It's not necessarily AI at this point, but it is kind of predictive based on your existing uh, data sets and workloads and again, I think solving a big problem for customers is how much is this gonna cost me? 
So in terms of you know, how this is going to work, and this is just a pictorial of what, what we'll show you in the demo, but you know, we have, as I said today, integrated directly on the array the ability to move data to the cloud. So all you need to do now is set up uh, you know, basically what we call a replication store in the cloud. That's really a destination for you to land your, your volumes or your data that's coming in from your on-premises array. You, from the arrays, you have an option, right? You could replicate data to obviously a secondary uh, device or array, uh, or you just select the cloud, right, as, as a destination. So super simple for our customers, right? What you see here is, right, no additional software, no additional hardware, right? It just plugs in directly in an array, and that's what we mean, right? When we say we're building this from ground up for the cloud. Yeah, you know, we're not trying to add middleware, we're not trying to add complexity, we want to build this natively into our devices. Now, from a customer standpoint, right, you can select the, the data sets and the volumes that you want to move to the cloud. You don't need to move everything. And then once you set up those policies, right, automatically our replication engine will start moving that data to the cloud. Now, again, optionally, right, you could just move that over for a you know, very simple backup or DR use case. Uh, if you actually need to spin the data up, we have the capabilities to do enterprise class zero copy clone. So, again, ability to make copies. Uh, in seconds, right, which is which is very cool, right, for the, you know, kind of DevOps or the cloud bursting type use cases. So we do this better than both AWS and Azure, right? If you want to take block data and make rapid copies of it to serve it up for a bursting scenario or DevOps uh, scenario, right, it would take, you, you, it would take you, in the case of AWS, you need to take a backup or snapshot into S3 and then copy that back over and create, a, you know, multiple copies of that. That would, you know, net, in many ways take hours uh, to do. Again, this is something we can do in seconds for, for addressing a cloud type use case. Now, once you, you do that, right, we could create obviously new data sets in the cloud or change data in the cloud. And again, now that we have the capability to do failover and fail back and bi-directional replication, right, the data, you know, any new data you created in cloud now can also be resynced uh, uh, or, or replicated back on premises as you need to. So in summary, uh, before I kind of jump into the demo, right, really what we're delivering with cloud volumes is, you know, really an enterprise grade cloud storage service, right, to deliver flash uh, performance and enterprise reliability and capabilities, whether, whether it be our durability and, and reliability, our capabilities to do, again, enterprise class snapshots and clones, uh, or even simple clustering support, right? I'll show you, like today, in, with block storage and cloud, again, it's single host access, right? So again, just the ability to attach multiple hosts, whether it be to cluster your database server or to provide multi-host access for different uh, use cases, that's something we support. The mobility piece I talked about, you know, really, again, bi-directional replication, get on and off the cloud. Also, uh, ability to attach your data sets, right, to either AWS or Azure, right? Again, that's not something you can easily do today uh, with, with, you know, if you're using the native uh, block storage. And again, achieve this and achieve hybrid cloud, so if you need to move the data back off, right, to reduce the lock-in and reduce the data egress charges. And then from a visibility standpoint, as I mentioned, you know, the, you know, everything from integrating to InfoSight as well as providing the cost estimates and the, um, and the predictive uh, cost analysis is, is huge, and that's something I'll show you guys in, in a quick demo. So in terms of you know, how our customers are using it today, right, so again, we've launched this about a year ago. Uh, we're really seeing you know, a, a good mix, right? Because this is block storage, uh, because this is flash, uh, but because it's also easy. So, so surprisingly, even though we, this is a flash storage solution in the cloud, we still have a, a big chunk of our customers just leveraging cloud volumes for backup and DR, just like, just like you know, some people would for cloud bank. And this is because, again, you can enable this directly right from your storage array, right? You don't need to you don't even need backup software, you don't need anything else, it's just a snapshot policy and you copy the data to the cloud. Now, again, it's, it's flash, it's lock, it's, it's more expensive than S3, so you know, it, people choose to do backup and DR with cloud volumes because it's simple, not because it's the cheapest solution. Because you could definitely do it more cost effectively by leveraging cloud bank or, or leveraging you know, backup software and whatnot. The second use case is really, I think, you know, what we expected originally, which is moving or migrating data to the cloud, uh, whether it be for test dev or whether it be for production, right? So actually moving a, a, a database 
and then uh, moving that data and then attaching that to a EC2 instance or Azure VM instance, uh, whether that's to do test dev or whether it is actually migrating that over as a production environment. The cloud volumes located at yeah, yeah so, so we, which, which cloud yeah yeah, yes. yeah so so we don't we run it in our own data center but in close proximity to both AWS and Azure data centers so you know on the back end it leverages you know in, into Azure Express route but that's um, that is we, we, we basically uh, that's abstracted from the customer so they don't need to manage any of that connectivity that's all managed through our software and API. So from their perspective, they just provide, uh, you know, in Azure, a VNet you know, access, right? And that, that provides connectivity into our cloud storage. So build into cloud volumes yeah. from availability zones. And yeah. yeah, like right now, it's, it's primarily, you know, within the same zone. But yeah, like both uh, intra-zone and uh, uh, inter-zone availability is, is something that we're you know, adding to the, to the roadmap. That's how you avoid the egress costs. Is you're co-located, you know, or in close proximity to the cloud data center, and and so the network costs. Well, they, they use Express Route, so it's all included. Like if you do the premium Express Route in inbound outbound, it's all included. Yeah. So so what's interesting is like both Express Route uh, and then your Direct Connect on AWS is. There are like either it's bundled or there is a very highly reduced rate on egress charges. So when you look at egress charges, it's also just the right data, right? So the data that you're writing into our cloud storage that is charged as egress. So there is in in most cases there is still some egress charge that's charged directly from AWS and Azure, but it's highly reduced. And then if a customer is actually taking the data from our cloud and then moving it on premises, right? We don't charge the customers for that at all, right? There's no egress charge for that. No, not, not yet. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously there is a there's VMware for AWS, right? There, so that's something we are working with them on in terms of integration. You know, they're still relatively early stage in terms of their deployment and customer adoption. So, uh, you yeah, that's really the primary method if you know for for leveraging VMware. Um, there are ways to to do uh, uh, or uh, Hyper V. Uh, the atoms that I won't I won't get into in this one, uh, but you know there are ways of doing it a little bit more. Uh, I wouldn't say seamless, but not relying on on a, a more specific solution. All right, so just a couple more slides, and I'll jump into the demo. Um, pricing standpoint, I mean I'm just sharing this because we're just being transparent. Uh, you know, with cloud volumes, right? It is a cloud storage service. So we publish these numbers on our website as well, too. So it's, you know, this is nothing, no secrets out there. Uh, it's, the pricing model is very similar to AWS in that you, you pay per gigabyte, right? And you pay per IOP, right? And we have two SLAs based on performance, right? We have our premium, which really delivers a 99% performance SLA. And then we have our general purpose, which is delivering around a 95% performance SLA. Uh, and, and again, our customers again could, could choose as many IOPS or as many gigabytes that they need, and they have two options: they pay as you go, right, on a monthly basis, or you know, a lot of our enterprise customers and our channel partners really like the prepay option because again, you know, it's kind of like a reserved instance, right? You kind of reserve that capacity uh, o uh, over a course, and you prepay for it. To me, I actually like the analogy of a Starbucks uh, card, right? You just top of your card with whatever $10,000 of credits, and each month you use the cloud storage, you just deduct it, right, out of your balance, and you know, we, we give a discount to our customers with that. Uh, two questions related. So I, first of all, I assume that's US dollars. Yes. yes. Second of all, is this available outside of continental US? And if so, is the dollars billed in US dollars at that point, or is it in the local currency? Yeah, good, good question. So right now, it, it is uh, available in the US only. Uh, our inter we are planning international rollout in, in the near future. Uh, so, I mean, I can't comment on, on how we're going to bill for it uh, outside of the U.S. But, yeah, that is, that is being planned, but right now, U.S. only. By handling uh, data governance, just keeping in the U.S., 
So that, that's going to be interesting how you guys. Yeah, yeah I that. mean, definitely Europe with GDPR and all that's going to make it interesting. Um, you know, we're, I mean, we're going to enter markets obviously where we have the most customer demand and, and, you know, we will, you know, in Europe, you know, address those concerns specifically. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't think we'll be deploying you know, cloud volumes in every single European country in the near future, but we will, you know, the ones where we see you know, the most customer demand and, and interest in. But yeah, that's, you know, that, I think that's, a, that's the same issue that both AWS, Azure, and GCP have too, right, is how do we address that now, you know, now that you know, everybody wants to have you know, their data locally inside their country. All right, so let me get into a, a quick demo. Um, I want to demo a few things, and I know we don't have that much time. I know we start 10 minutes late, so hopefully I still have about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, I was going to sh show you guys cloud, cloud Volumes demo in the portal, which is pretty simple, uh, straightforward, but also show you some of the capabilities around the replication, right, which is new. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is, you know, there, there were a lot of questions around, as I said, InfoSight, and you know, how are we doing the cloud today? So I actually wanted to show you, um, you know, the capabilities we built into the predictive cost estimates on InfoSight. So I'll actually start with that first, uh, because I think that's, again, it's, it's a simple thing, but it's a huge thing for, for customers, right? Is, is that how do I get to, to, to my cloud storage costs uh, and you know, controlling my, re reining in my uh, cloud costs in general. So when I look at this, um, I, I've already logged into InfoSight and hopefully it didn't log me out. So we actually have a set of tools. You guys didn't you know, see uh, a full InfoSight uh, tour or demo, and I'm not going to do that. You know, these are some of the operational dashboards that we have here. But we also have an interesting uh, tabs here called Labs. So Labs are you know, a, really a collection of tools that we have uh, that leverage some of the advanced AI and the advanced machine learning and analytics that a lot of customers can use. And one of the things that we rolled out a few months ago is actually our, our cloud volumes, uh, you know, sizing tool that really provides you the predictive uh, cost estimates. So let me just load this up here in the InfoSight Labs. Now, what's cool about this is, of course, you know, being, you know, being an HPE customer, right? And having that data tel telemetry in InfoSight already, right? We actually already know, right, what data is on your storage array. So, in this aspect, what's cool is it allows us to select, right, which uh, which arrays or which data sets you want to move. So, if I go here and actually, you know, the fonts are probably a little small, but the pool actually refers to a pool of arrays or a set of arrays that that have been assigned. And these are actually, I think, you know, our IT arrays that we're using here and. Again, let's just select a production environment, and you know, I think I'm I think I'm selecting one of our Exchange servers, and again, I could you know go down to the volume level, right? So I picked uh, I picked one of our arrays that that is supporting our Exchange environment, and here I could see that you know I have a database volume, I have a journal and a log volume, but you know if I again if I just choose the database volume, and say how much will it cost me, right? If I want to move my Exchange server database right to the cloud. And just by saving these changes, right, in terms of what I want to estimate, again, I could go and calculate the you know, replication store size and you know, estimated costs. So what you see here is, again, just by taking the telemetry data, I'm able to, again, as a customer, determine that, hey, I have basically a 16.7 uh, terabyte exchange database, right? This will cost me, again, I know the font sizes are a little bit small, uh, that will cost me about twenty about twenty thousand dollars a year, right, uh, to move that to our general purpose flash tear in HP Cloud Volumes. So right off the bat, right, no consultants, no you know uh, d data triaging, uh, no special analysis, right. We could tell our customers, you know, basically approximately what your expected cloud spend is for a particular data volume or particular data set that you want to move to the cloud. So I, yeah, th this is pretty unique. I don't think you know AWS or Azure. I mean, AWS ha has you know an online calculator that you could type in how many gigabytes or how many uh, you know, what's your read write on those volumes and all that. But you know, this is taking your actual real data on your arrays and telling, hey, this is how much it's going to cost you to move to the cloud. So I think this is pretty cool, pretty game changing for a lot of customers that are thinking about right thinking about moving to the cloud. Now they have a good idea right within seconds how much it's going to cost you. Okay, so that's the InfoSight uh, predictive cost estimate. So let's, um, let's 
make sure I'm still on the VPN here. So I am. OK. So now let's get to the cloud volumes itself. So like any other cloud service, right, this is you know on our website today, right, cloud volumes, and directly accessible through a website as well, too. So any customer coming here right, can click through our website and, and sign in to HPE Cloud Volumes. So I think I'm still signed in. If not, OK, I need to re-log in. So uh, you know, again, like any web service, we have the portal. As I mentioned earlier, we now also have API. Uh, as well as command line access. So in, in Michael's presentation, right, leveraging our containers uh, provider, you're going to see a lot more, a uh, lot more use of the APIs and and the command line versus the portal itself. So here, let me just sign into the portal. And what you see here is just a couple volumes, right, storage volumes that I have uh, set up already. Uh, one of them, as you can see, the first one is attached to AWS. The other volume I have set up here is attached to Azure, so already a multi-cloud environment. Uh, you know, very simple to make changes. You'll see if I click on one of these existing volumes, you see here uh, it's retrieving some data from InfoSight. So again, you know, we already have some baseline integration, right? We have the cost estimates. We also have the performance analytics and the capacity uh, built into here too. So you can see kind of. You know, the performance history and it kind of dipped a few days ago and and now we're kind of driving more io again on this now what's cool again is you know unlike a lot of cloud block storage where it's kind of fixed as i said like a ssd or a disk right we can make changes on the fly right with cloud volumes i could go here and change the, the size obviously you need, might need to refresh that at the os level i could change the performance of this too and again what you see here is Again, real-time predictive uh, estimates, right? So here you can see the little green box it says right now we're paying you know 60 bucks a month, right? If I want to increase the number of IOPS on this volume to say 1,500, right? You, you can see that it goes up to 102 dollars per month. So real-time again, you make real changes, right? Customers can see that immediately. So you know I might as well go and uh, apply that uh, and make that change. And again, you know, you can make these changes on the fly, which again, you know, in a kind of fixed SSD or a fixed uh, a disk in the cloud environment, that's something you cannot do. Other thing you can do here is you can see I'm already attached to one uh, cloud VM, right? That's uh, that, that's here. Again, for multi-host clustering, right? We can add another one, right? I could go and, and say I have a list here. This is on an AWS network, so it's on a on a VPC on AWS. And again, I could just select another virtual machine that I want to attach to as well, too. So again, to provide multi-host access is super, super simple. Now, one of the things I really want to show you was the data replication. So the data replication is super cool. Uh, as I mentioned, today we, we have bidirectional failover, fail, fail back. Now, again, in, uh, in the essence of time, right, I wanted to, some of this has already been set up. So what, what I'll show you here is, you know, the replication volumes that we have already set up. So these are volumes that I have on another array that, that is already replicating uh, into the cloud volumes today. You can see that uh, here it says it's incoming. So that's coming in from an array. So there's these four volumes here. And, you know, just to show you that, you know, this is not smoke and mirrors, I'm actually going to log into that array and show you that those volume sets as well too. So. This, you can see, is actually a GUI login for one of our storage arrays. It's actually, again, this is a live demo. Uh, you can see here it's in SJC, which is San Jose, so in our, in our labs back in our head office. right? So I'm actually going to log into this. So this, this is the you know, Nimble Storage uh, Hardware uh, Administration GUI that, that you have access to. And that's why I had to check my VPN to make sure I was connecting back to our network. Now, again, super simple, right? I could go and look at the data storage. And again, the exact same uh, four volumes that I had listed in the cloud, right? You see it is set up here, right, with, with cloud volumes. Now, in terms of the data replication, let me just show you how simple it is to set up. Uh, you know, for, for us to set up, you know, basically cloud replication is just adding a replication partner. So in this case here, I, 
I've already have that uh, initial one set up. If I wanted to add another one, you see I have the option, right? I have the option for on-premises, right? So that's replicating to another array. Or I have the option for cloud replication. All I need to do in this case is just enter my username and password for cloud volumes, and that will authenticate this array against your cloud storage. Again, I won't do that because that's already set up. But what I will do instead is, again, show you uh, the change in replication. So in this case right now, you'll see that this replication is you know, going outbound to the cloud. You see a little bit here in small font, the cloud, and the direction is, is outbound. So you know, one of the things I could do here is, you know, again, for a failover or, again, writing new data that's created in the cloud back on premise is to reverse the replication uh, direction here. So what I'll do here is I'll go into our, one of our replication stores. And then you know, we group the different volumes into, into volumes collection. So I have three volumes grouped in one and, and another one that I call here a uh, failover that's grouped, uh, grouped in, a, in a separate collection here. So if I take the failover collection, I could actually modify, right? Again, super simple, right? Modify the direction. So right now, it's taking the data from the array, incoming from the array. So let's just switch it around, right? Make it an outgoing. So I'll apply that here. So that's one step. So that will change now, you know, basically promote this as the primary data source. And all I need to do is switch back over to the array itself and again select that volume collection. Uh, and, and basically what we say is, oops, select it. And in this case, now demote it, right? This is no longer the primary data source. It's going to be the, the receiver. Or the, uh, so I will demote this into, into the secondary data source. And if I just give it a sec, see, now I switch back to the replication store, you see that now it is a bidirectional, right? So you can see there, again, small fonts, I apologize, uh, you know, but now we've, we're doing bidirectional replication. So some of the volumes are coming into the cloud, some of the volumes are coming back out of the cloud, in, back onto your storage array. Do you have a zoom function to zoom in a little bit? Like I know. Uh... Like that. Like that. Yeah. So Bidirectional. People on the webcast can see it. Yeah, no, good point. How does a cloud volume, how does the cloud instance know which array to switch to? So like if we have a VM running in Azure, how does it know live which way to go? Like if you're coming across your express route into my VNet and then all of a sudden I switch the live volume to the one I have on-prem, how does the VM that's using the volume switch? And then the second question is, what do you guys recommend for like the root drives? If you can do all this for the data drives, how do they, <clears throat> how does a customer effectively leverage it if they want to use it for anything but data? Like how do they move their OS or? Yeah, yeah I mean the root drives are definitely, you know, a more challenging proposition for a variety of reasons. One, you know, again, you know, VMDKs versus AMIs versus you know, Azure uh, VM formats. Um, so that's one aspect. Part of that, right, I think, you know, part of that can be addressed in con with containers, right? So that's, I think, you know, Michael will talk about that next. Uh, so that, that aspect you know, potentially can be solved with that. Uh, in terms of, you know, which arrays you set this up for. So in terms of letting the host know. Uh, I you guys use what? iSCSI or something? Or NFS? Yeah, that, it's iSCSI, so yes. Does it just update the IP that it's supposed to use or? Yeah, yeah so, 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 so in this case, case right? right, so if I am reversing the replication, that it, it's still able to, so in this case, right, I could either, so I, I could either create, if it was coming incoming, right, uh, data coming in from an array into the cloud, I would actually create a clone, right, to attach that to, to a VM, and it will con continue using that VM. Now that I've reversed the replication, actually, right, after a reverse replication, I'm actually able to now make the cloud volume the source, right? So in this case, but I mean, like on the actual VM, like wouldn't the initial or wouldn't the target change mm -hmm. the IP of the target? So like my Windows VM says I need to send data to this volume via this iSCSI target. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that IP change from my array and cloud volumes to my array? Yeah, yeah it would be a different volume okay. on, on that. Yeah, so we would you know, effectively attach another oh, so volume. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not an process. I got it. No. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah, so again, this is more, this is not like an automatic failover, right? It is more of a disaster scenario, right? Like, I, again, I have to promote a, a volume because I can't access it on-prem or vice versa. You're only going to do it if it's really a disaster. It's not like I'm going to shut the system down on-prem for 20 minutes a day, do a Correct. window. <laughs> Correct. It's, yeah. it's like, like, oh, crap. Yes. Correct. Yeah, this is... Yeah. Correct. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to patch the system in here real quick. It's not going to hurt it. Yeah, I mean, you, again, you can do it for dev test, right? So, for example, we could take, take that clone and then you can patch it in the cloud, right? And again, test it to make sure it's all good. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, and then patch it back you know, on prem or, or do whatever you want with it. We have like PowerShell support or API rest. support. Yep. Rest. To be yep. able to rest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. I mean, just I'll show you simply here. I know what, what's our time here. Yeah, a few minutes. So you know, in terms of you know just setting it up. You, so yes, we do have PowerShell. Uh, and in terms of setting it up, you know, if I, for example, I just cr reverse the replication and I want to connect this to the cloud, right? First off, I just select the cloud provider, the region, uh, the net. The network, and again the IOPS that I want. It gives me the estimate. Now th this basically attaches it to either the VNet or the VPC, right? That I, I selected. Once I do that, I can actually, you know, that's where I leverage uh, a PowerShell command to actually, you know, attach it to the I iSCSI initiator. So once I've done that, you'll see that. The new volume that's now available on the cloud, right, shows up here, right? The HP cloud volumes. So the last step I need to do now is attach it to my VM. Right? So I've already selected the network I'm on. I got these five VMs or four VMs on, on that network. So I'll just att attach it to this one. So that's the one I have open. And here you'll see, right? So we, we got uh, here's a PowerShell command, right? That actually attaches that that uh, that volume to that VM. So if I copy it, and I actually do have that EC2 instance up up and running right now. So yeah, yeah. And by the way, just just to let you know, everything you know, no smoke and mirrors. If you guys remember earlier in the demo, right? I changed the I/O from 800 to 1500. You see that I'm running the IOmeter here, and it's at 1500. So yeah, no, this is all live. I'm a marketing guy. I like I like to run by the seat of my pants. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Let's see if I can get it copy and paste properly. All right. So there you go. Oh, I know why. You're not supposed to admit you're a marketing guy, by the way. I know. I'm a, I'm a marketing guy with an engineering degree. There you go. That's how it goes. All right. See, I can't copy and paste. That's that's the one thing. Make sure this goes. There you go. Right. So it's again a simple PowerShell command. That that's what actually you see here. It just popped up on the background here. So now that that volume that was on the array is now available uh, on this cloud volume. And then if I again use go up to Windows Explorer, and this is the yeah. This volume here, you see, I have one file here. Again, I now if I go and open another window, let's see if I just go to downloads and say, hey, I got a file here. I want to copy over. Oops. Oops. So. You know, all the data right now, this is a cloud volume that was you know, replicated from Array. I've just written data now onto this cloud volume because I've reversed the replication direction now. Any new data, right, that's being written to the cloud, right, is now being replicated back to the Array as well, too. That's set on a schedule, so I can't initiate that automatically, so that's replicating every hour. But you know, what you'll see is, you know, an hour from now, you know, the, the size of that volume on the Array will, will have increased by whatever that uh, file size is. So that's really it. I you know, just wanted to show you guys some simple stuff. 
again, it, it's supposed to be simple, right? Then, as I said, I'm 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 an engineer uh, or a you know, a marketing guy with an engineering degree doing this, so it, it's pretty pretty easy. Uh, as I said, we have APIs and command lines now too. So you know, guys like Michael, who's really you know much more attuned to the command line and DevOps, can can leverage that in a container environment. Uh, we have now the capabilities, as I said, to do bidirectional replication, and again, delivering this across both AWS and Azure. And again, with our different solutions, what's cool about it is, you know, these capabilities, right? We are building right into our storage portfolio, right? So this is not a standalone cloud service, right? This is working directly with our nimble storage arrays. You know, three par is 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 looking at adding you know capabilities around this too. We talked about store once and cloud bank and how we're leveraging that. So, you know, from an HPE perspective, it's always you know our view of it is you know let's not duct tape and glue into the cloud, right? We want to have your data a, you know, anywhere you want it to be, and you want to make it simple for you. And that's really you know ultimately cloud volumes is just an example of that. But ultimately, this is something we want to do across our storage portfolio. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.